This episode of Agalia Chats is brought to you by Wolvik, the only open source web browser available for XR devices like Huawei VR Glass, the Oculus and Pico families, and more. Visit wolvik.com to learn more. And if you love the whole idea, please stop by opencollective.com slash Wolvik to lend your support. Hello there, I'm Eric Meyer, and I'm a developer advocate at Agalia. And I am Brian Cardell, and I'm also a developer advocate at Agalia. Hi, I'm Rachel Andrew. I work for Chrome at Google and I lead developer content there. So that's primarily publishing to web.dev and developer.chrome.com. Yeah, and we asked Rachel on today because there's a thing happening in CSS. There's a lot of things happening in CSS, but the thing we want to talk about today is masonry layout. So we have Flexbox layout and we have grid layout and we have other forms of layout that we don't use anymore for the most part. So masonry is kind of the Pinterest layout thing, or uh, if you're of a somewhat older bent, the Flickr layout uh, approach, where you have tracks of content that slot together. Uh, this has been, I mean, it's a, it's a relatively common layout pattern, but CSS doesn't have super convenient ways to do it so far. Uh, so Rachel, what did I get wrong about my description of masonry? <laughs> I think it's really hard to describe layout on a podcast, <laughs> you know, I end up sort of like gesticulating with my hands. So I, yeah, I think <laughs> masonry is an interesting one because it's kind of a mixture of layout methods. I mean, you can, the sort of closest you can really get to it at the moment uh, is with multicol. If, you know, if you have a bunch of, say, images and you use multicol to lay them out, you'll get something that looks like a masonry layout. Um, which you don't have strict rows, you have things that sort of fall into columns and then they're not lined up in rows across. The problem with that is the content order goes down the column. And actually what people want with masonry is they want to go across the row typically uh, in, in terms of the order of stuff. And so that's really what people are asking for is this kind of tightly packed layout that doesn't have strict rows. If you try and do that with grid, you end up with gaps. Because the, you know, if you have your sort of first row, you have your tallest item in there, that's going to define the height of the row. So you're going to end up with a space underneath things next to it. Um, and yeah, so masonry has this kind of nice, tightly packed layout where it kind of doesn't matter how tall the things are, for example, because you know, they, they're going to rise up next to each other. So it's almost like a sort of 2D flex layout, I guess. Um, <laughs> but it's not like a strict grid when you look at it. It's, it's a, a set of columns with, you know, with stuff in. Uh, and yes, describing these things on, on a podcast isn't easy. The thing I like about what both of you said is that like you're trying to describe masonry and, and it's also to some extent masonry as you understand it. But, you know, it's a metaphor. It's an abstraction. And there are slightly different variants of what people have done and called masonry. The name came from comparing it to walls made of blocks like where they're kind of uneven but that seems like actually kind of a poor analogy because you would not really have a mortar joint that travels completely directly vertically on a wall probably hmm. and if you think about like bricks are also masonry like if you're describing bricks um i have wall outside my house that's made of literal stones and they have lines that go across horizontally you know so I don't know. It's interesting because I think, you know, we're struggling for a name and we're dealing with past names that people have come up with. And there was no standard that somebody wrote down that said, this is what masonry means. And so people have interpreted differently. This is the thing that happens all the time in standards, right? So now we get to a point where we do want to write it down. We do want to standardize, make it easy. But it's like, first, we have to agree on like, what is the it? And then second, it's going to potentially involve... How much is the it like other things and how much does that matter, both technically in the sense of things that we already have, like grid, or do we call it masonry or does that not work conceptually because of how we're defining it or because of maybe language barriers? Maybe that's a very Anglo-centric kind of term or something. Or also other terms are also used like waterfall and I, I can see the visual metaphor there but also maybe that's loaded. So it's an interesting question when you talk about naming always, you know, so famously one of the, the hard problems. 
Yeah, yes, definitely. And it's sort of interesting, because we have our content on developer.chrome.com machine translated into, into a whole bunch of languages. And we actually started to get, after that post went up, we've got people who speak English and another language telling us how badly the machine translation was translating masonry. Um, so that's kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, we, we get that this for all sorts of things, obviously, because machine translation tends to try and very literally translate things, which uh, results in all kinds of hilarious things. But that, you know, just that, that was interesting that, you know, it doesn't really translate that well, you know, to whatever it ends up as. Um, and I think that's that's definitely a thing with with naming things uh, is is how does that work, you know, around the world and how does that work when it's, you know, in another language? Yeah. And I imagine if we were to change it, let's say from masonry to waterfall, that probably wouldn't help any in that way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, there's a there's never a perfect answer to this, but I think naming is a good place to be going out and getting developer feedback because, especially if we can get out to a more diverse range of people and people who speak different languages, because then hopefully we can pick up where names just seem really odd to to someone that that might not to those of us who who only speak English and are used to the way that technical things are named didn't we try to give this a name eric where like if you poll people on the internet you wind up with somewhere around like 50 50 on everything i, I call it <laughs> cardell's law of internet polls right yeah which states more or less that almost any poll you put online will end up 50 50. yeah I'm, I'm not convinced that voting on these things is great i think putting it out there and saying hey does anyone have any feedback on this does anyone have any thoughts D does this make sense in terms of how you see this yeah D to sort of pick up yeah to pick up the the really poor choices that we might not notice you know culturally you know sometimes words have meanings that you know, you, you just don't know and so i think i think that's um you know, I mean, say even even between Brits and Americans, there can there can be things that you know are, are, are very different. You know, and, and and so I think I think that that putting names out like that is actually quite useful. Not so much for we're going to use the one that most people vote for, because these votes as well are always very kind of biased to the people who are sharing it and so on. Can we maybe manage to put a U in masonry somewhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, hope hopefully we can actually get in front of some people who are going to say, hang on, that really doesn't mean that here, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I mean, we've all in this group been involved in, in getting developer feedback and, you know, in, in sort of our pre-recording discussions, Rachel, you, you made the statement, which is absolutely hundred percent true. Asking for developer feedback is really hard, especially what's hard is asking for that feedback in a way that properly sets the expectations. Right. I think when we ask for feedback, sometimes, you know, we can make it sound like that's the only thing that matters. You know, what do developers think? And of course, that usually isn't the only thing that matters. It's why we have, you know, such a range of people in the CSS working group, uh, which I think is brilliant. There are browser engineers, and there, but there are also people who really come from very different backgrounds, from web development backgrounds. You know, I tend to think about things in terms of how easy would this be for me to talk about on stage or to write about and explain it to people. Um, and I think when we ask for feedback, that's the kind of thing we're hoping to get is, yeah, you know, these sort of opinions from people who write about things um, or who taught it to their team uh, and they've, they've realized where people struggle. Uh, and just, you know, what people feel ergonomically works well for them in order to bring that back as one factor. And I think we have to be really careful about not going out there and making it sound like we're asking for a public vote and we're going to go the way that the most people think, um, because it can only ever be one part of that decision. Uh, it's an important one. I mean, we wouldn't be asking so often <laughs> for people to contribute if it wasn't. But it is just one factor. And I think we need to set those expectations that, you know, it might be that actually a lot of people want something to be one way, but ultimately we have to go another because something else um, kind of became more important for whatever reason, you know, performance or just what's feasible in all of the engines so that it can become interoperable. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think that's, you know, it is an important sort of expectation to set when you when you ask these things, you know, what are you actually asking and what, what can people expect, you know, when they give answers? Yeah. Um, so let's uh, let's get into the weeds a little bit. There are at the moment 
two main proposals mm -hmm. for how to do masonry layout. You know, what properties are we going to have and, you know, how are they going to relate to other things? Can you actually give them a summary, Rachel? Yeah, I think you know, the, the two main proposals really are, do we want masonry to be part of grid so that you end up with turning it on with, you know, a, a, a value of masonry and, and then grid, it, it sort of all behaves like grid layout, basically, except in, in one dimension. So you essentially end up with a grid that doesn't have rows defined. Um, and sorry, I just want to interject. That would be the default, I guess. But you could you also go the other way? So yes, I believe that's yeah. Way? Okay. Yeah that's it you know so you only have it in one dimension um and the thing with grid layout is that it was always defined as you know a two-dimensional layout system so that kind of is a sort of a you know would start behaving somewhat differently than you would expect so the, the the two proposals so the other proposal really is to define masonry as its own thing display masonry and then it does its own thing um, i think what is important to say is that whichever way it goes that doesn't mean it needs to become limited in any way. Where it's defined does not kind of impact the features that it has. It, you know, it really is how do you get into a masonry layout? How do you tell the browser that's what you want to do? That's really what we're talking about with the two proposals is whether you would you know, be using display grid and um, then you would have a value um, for columns or rows, which was masonry, and, and, and then you use it that way. Or would you say display masonry? And then you'd have a different set of properties, assuming we were using masonry as the name, to create the column tracks if you're using columns and and uh, and do things very similar to how you do them in grid layout. Different, but remarkably similar names, <laughs> right? Yeah, yes. Um, the I guess the where we start to get into the weeds is that grid and masonry are, are different. You know, they're, they're not the same layout method and they're not the same layout method really at a, a sort of very core level. Um, how it's been described to me really by uh, one of our team is that they're opposite in terms of how the browser deals with sizing and so on. So now that's not obvious to, you know, regular person using grid or, or masonry. It wasn't actually really opposite to me because I'm not a browser engineer and I had to have it explained to me. So when the grid is laid out, all of the items are placed before layout. So the browser knows exactly what is in each track. And that's really important when it comes to sizing stuff. We need to know how big things are, um, particularly when it comes to intrinsic sizing. So that's, you know, auto size things where you're not actually fixing the size of the track and putting something in it and telling it to be the size of that track. With masonry, to get that kind of jiggly effect uh, where things aren't in strict rows, the items are kind of placed as they're laid out and the browser doesn't actually know how many it's going to have. Now, the browser engineers tell me that this isn't a problem if you have all intrinsic tracks or all your tracks are auto or all fixed size tracks. When you start to mix the two, it gets problematic because the browser is having to kind of lay everything out and figure out how big it is. And, and obviously, if you get very large grids, that could become a performance problem. Yeah, so, so at, at its core, the two layout methods, although they don't look different on the surface, they actually are in terms of what the browser is doing, which creates problems. And what that actually causes for developers is that we're going to have to tell you that you can't use bits of the grid spec, in particular, mixing intrinsic and, um, and a fixed size tracks. So something quite common that people do in grid is you might have a couple of fixed size tracks with an auto track that then just gets as big or as small as, as is needed. You can't do things like that without hitting these performance problems. The concern is that if we bundle the two together, you're going to have to remember which bits of grid work when you're doing masonry, which isn't ideal. It, it's sort of just something that people are going to have to keep track of. And every time we write about this stuff, we're going to have to explain you know, if, if I'm writing a grid layout article, for example, and I, I, I show, you know, a track sizing, which has mixed, um, fixed and intrinsic tracks, so I say that, you know, this is fine if you're in grid, but if you're using masonry, you can't use this. It's, it's an ever case. That feels difficult. You mean it feels difficult to sort of explain to people in a way that they're going to retain it and not end up just complaining about how masonry is slightly broken grid or... Yeah. Or, or saying... 
oh yeah, I try, I keep trying to do this thing in masonry that you can, and it seems like you should be able to because you can do it in grid, but you can't do it in masonry and this sucks and I hate it. Yeah. And this is really inconsistent. And, and I kind of remember, you know, when we first introduced um, Flexbox and grid, people would frequently tell me like all the time people are saying, oh, this, this behaves really inconsistently. And what they meant was it had kind of broken their assumptions of how layout worked on the web because they were used to block layout and they were used to work the way that worked. And the minute you got into a flex or a grid formatting context, things started to work differently. And that was unexpected. And I think, you know, quite a few of us did quite a lot of explaining of formatting contexts and what happened, you know, when you switched into a different formatting context, that meant that things inside behave differently. And we've kind of, I think, got to a point where I don't see people talking about grid being inconsistent with block layout anymore. I think people understand that difference. And so I kind of don't like the idea of then saying, oh, now you're in a grid formatting context, but if you're using masonry, it behaves differently than it does normally. Then it's like a whole new layer of, <laughs> of uh, potential inconsistency to try and explain. Um, it just doesn't seem as clean to me as having it separately. Right. So the other proposal, as you say, which is the one that I think you're in favor of, is instead of saying display grid and then something like grid template rows masonry or something like that would just be to say display masonry and then there would be you know masonry track property and, and masonry yeah. packing property and, and things like that which i would think that the objection there would be we're mostly doing layout things that are already defined elsewhere why are we coming up with whole new property names isn't that going to confuse people trying to learn when they say, wait, I was already doing columns and rows, but now I have another name that does apparently the same thing? Yeah, but I think I think we can, you know, the values of these things are going to be roughly the same with some allowed or, or not allowed things um, that are different across them. And I think it's it's the values that, you know, the, the say the track sizing values um, are something which I think is, you know, can be carried over to masonry. And, uh, you know, it, it's something I was sort of pondering is, you know, could they be carried over to, to multicol, for example? Because one of the things we get asked about multicol is can we have different sized columns? Uh, we can't currently do that. If you, you know, you, in multicol, you split it into columns, you can have, you know, they can only be the same size. Could this track sizing be useful there? And I think that the, the value, the, the clever track sizing stuff from grid is probably useful in lots of other things. There may be other layout methods in the future that people want, uh, that we might want to use the same kind of track sizing with. So I think just the fact that something has very similar values doesn't necessarily mean it should be the same thing. I think we should definitely reuse what we can. And, and obviously a lot of the things that, are, you know, that people see as part of grid are actually box alignment. For example, gap you know, isn't part of the grid spec. It's part of the box alignment spec. Or well, the alignment properties are going to be the same because they're not part of the grid spec. You know, they're used in grid and flexbox and, and now block layout as well. So quite a lot of the things people are actually wanting, and when I see the discussions, aren't even part of the grid spec. They're part of box alignment. And so, uh, you know, we already have things sort of fairly well broken down. Yeah, I feel sometimes like the actual barrier to understanding is that a lot of these things arose in specific layout specs like Flexbox or like Grid, and now they're being moved into more generic spots. Basically, mm. they've, they've been taken out of Flexbox or Grid or, or even Block Layout and put into, let's say, the Block Alignment module. Yeah. Like, Gap was like this, right? There was Grid Gap. And then basically, the developer said, that's really cool, and it'll work in Flex, right? And <laughs> it, yeah. it didn't. <laughs> so. Then there was a, I can't remember if flex gap was ever implemented or it was just proposed. And but basically, the group said, let's just have gap, and gap will work for both of those, and it can work in other places maybe at some point. And so I think I think sometimes that's the the learning curve that people have. You know, someone who's coming to this new doesn't have that problem. They just learn here's alignment, and here's flex, and here's grid, and grid and flex refer back to alignment. Fine, but for those of us who sort of learned as we went over time, there, there tends to be that, oh, that's a grid thing. And then, you know, someone says, well, it was, and it still works in grid, but it's not grid anymore. 
Yeah, yeah. I think I think you know these things are evolving, and I think that that's something I find really interesting. I've, I've done a fair few talks where I've kind of talked about how you know things are building on top of other things. You know where we've got to at this point is you know sort of years of work where we're kind of building up on this stuff. I think you know Subgrid is a really good example. There was you know a point where there was every chance that we would implement you know would have specced and, and people would have implemented a, a type of subgrid that would have locked the subgrid to both dimensions uh, so you'd have to know exactly how many items you had you know both for columns and rows to be able to use subgrid which would have you know hugely limited things and I think you know we we sort of hung back from from doing that um, and it took a while to actually get something we wanted and I, I think this sort of evolution of of layout in particular you know over the last sort of 10 years or so is is really interesting and i think it really shows the value of sometimes waiting a bit and getting a bit more information or waiting until we've just got more stuff happening you know thing other things have been worked out in css that allows us then to to move forward and do things in a, in a far better way than than we might have done had we just kind of gone ahead with the first idea right i, I know we're kind of wandering away from masonry here but it I think it illuminates why this discussion is happening right now, where CSS, for all the people called it a layout language for 20 some years, wasn't really. It was a presentation language. It didn't really have mm -hmm. layout. And then with Flex and Grid, it has gotten some layout. CSS, the CSS working group, CSS experts, CSS teachers, CSS users are all sort of working out together, sort of feeling our way through how are we going to lay things out? Like, how does layout actually work? We, we haven't really had that. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the hardest thing to explain to people is we're still building this plane as we fly it. <laughs> you yeah. know, you might think the language is almost 30 years old. You should have figured this out by now. No, we actually didn't even start trying to figure this part out until five or 10 years ago. And maybe that seems like a long time, but it really isn't. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting looking back. Actually, the, the, the whole sort of masonry discussion as we, we started talking about this, it, it caused me to look back at sort of my involvement with, with Grid because I was looking back to see when I'd first posted about, about masonry, which actually was in 2017. I'd raised an issue on the working group about people wanted masonry. But I also then looked, thought, hang on, how old is my site gridbyexample.com? And it's going to be celebrating its 10th birthday this year. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I think for a lot of people, some of this stuff still seems quite new. But, you know, we've been kind of talking about it and evolving it and figuring out the use cases, figuring out what's the next thing people need. Uh, you know, for all of this time, you know, with with Grid and, and, and even before that with, with Flexbox. And I think that's. It's it's interesting. It's an interesting kind of story. And and as new people come into the community, they just don't know any of that because they just turn up. They want to build things. Grid's there, <laughs> you know. And so yeah, I think it's it's interesting. I, I I'm sort of kind of fascinated by the evolution of of all of this stuff. Same with me and Brian. We talk about this all the time. I was going to say I'm glad that you brought up the history because I was going to also mention your issue in 2017. And it's fascinating that like, if you look at that issue, like if you look back on that issue, which doesn't seem like it could be from 2017, <laughs> you see like you originally say something and you say it feels more like Flexbox than Grid. And then immediately Jen Simmons replies and says, yes, also people bring it up to me. And yeah, it seems more like Flexbox, but maybe also kind of like multi-call. And it takes almost no time for tab atkins to say you can't do this with grid like it, it's very different there's no way there's no simple way to adapt grid into masonry because it would involve non-trivial edits to the layout algorithm i think ultimately we were just like you know beating around this fundamental um question for a long time and when you say it like that it sounds really frustrating and i guess Kind of it is really frustrating, but you know, this is one of maybe a hundred things that all of the same people are also working on at any given point yes. in time. So, you know, the amount of time that it gets in any given at any given moment is like really in fits and starts usually, right? Like somebody writes a blog post 
or somebody reinvigorates the issue and then it gets a lot of attention for a little while and then it kind of dies out. That's part of why I think interop is such a valuable thing because it, it says, okay, nobody's going to lose interest. We're going to focus on this for like a year and like, we're going to take this as far as we can in a year. I do kind of wonder if we had been able to really focus on this starting in maybe 2017 or at least by 2019, because if I recall correctly, I think 2019, we had to ask this working group face-to-face at the Egalia headquarters, right? And I think that that is the face-to-face where Mozilla presented yes. their implementation and it re- again reinvigorated this, right? It did, yeah. It, it actually, interestingly, that I mean, it's a slight side topic, but one I'd like to mention um, is at that face to face. I remember we had a discussion about this sort of reading order issue, which yes. I very strongly felt that we shouldn't be doing masonry um, until we had a solution for the fact that these automatic sort of layout methods have a sort of an impact where they can kind of jumble up the the sort of visual reading order and the kind of tab order as you go through the document. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something that I'm currently working on. And there's, there's an engineer at Chrome prototyping the, this sort of resulting specification that we've, we've sort of been working on for, for reading order items, which hopefully would would solve that issue. And I think it's it's kind of interesting that the two have popped up, you know, Masonry's popped up again at the time when we have actually possibly got a path forward for the reading order issue. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so it, it was it was that same working group that I know we, we spent a bit of time just sort of noodling on how would sort of this reading order switch work. And it's sort of interesting. Yeah, they've, they've come around at the same time. I'm willing to accept hate mail on the fact that I wanted to delay grid until we answered that question, because um, it feels really weird to have a mode for grid that you just say like, yeah, but you can't don't use that. Like, cause if it, it yeah. would reorder things. And exactly. So, I feel like there's a whole there. bunch it's of the stuff thing that you always wanted, but, but <laughs> yeah, don't use it. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I really hope that um, we're getting somewhere with this, this reading order idea um, that will allow people to do this kind of reordering if they need to. And also then will account for these kind of automatic layout methods. So things like dense packing in grid uh, is the other place where it particularly happens. Um, and masonry, um, we can make sure that we don't just end up creating a really weird, disconnected experience for people. You've said that, and I think Jen has also said that people basically saw dense packing and grid layout and were like, oh, cool, masonry. And then right. yeah. found out that it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. All of my original demos, I'd, you know, I'd show the dense packing and people, it, you, people like in the audience at like an event apart would be like, oh, that's masonry. Uh, and you'd have to kind of explain that, no, it's not. That's a different, you know, it's doing a different thing. But yeah, so it was interesting, actually, because we had a lot of people in the early days asking for masonry, seeing dense packing, thinking it was masonry, saying, why can't we do masonry? And then it kind of just sort of went quiet and people stopped really asking for it. Um, and it seems to have just made a bit of a resurgent. And I don't know if that's just, you know, trends. People start to to see, you know, layout methods they want to be able to do because obviously, you know, web design changes and and what's popular but it's interesting that it's kind of come pop back up again and, and we're all talking about it again yeah because there's the proposal that was published on the webkit blog mm-hmm. and then your proposal that was published at developer.chrome.com a lot of people probably read all this as just like google versus apple <laughs> titan cage flight only <laughs> one may read right. but it's really about people who work at google and people who work at Apple have different takes on how this should get done. I'm just wondering, as one of the people who has the different take, how does that outside reading actually feel? The people sort of taking it as, you know, Titan fight. I mean, it's always sort of strange. When you work for a giant company like Google, um, you know, people make a lot of assumptions about what actually goes on. And you actually, when you look into it, you know, all of these companies, it's a very small number of people working on the browser engine. Yeah. And, it, you know, and for layout, it's a very tiny number of people who are working on specs and browser engineering for layout, you know, like a small number of people that, that we can probably all name. Uh, you know, we, we come across them in the working group and so on. So it's a very small group of people. And I think the reason that, you know, we sort of wanted to respond to 
this um, is that we kind of felt that the WebKit post did one thing incredibly well. It asked a, a question that we've wanted the answer to, which is, do developers want something more than Pinterest out of masonry? You know, because what we don't want to do in CSS typically is build a whole load of stuff that no one wants. We want to make sure that when we you know, specify something, we maybe we just start with the basics and we can add to it later. We don't want to specify loads of stuff um, if no one's actually going to want to use it anyway. So there was a, a very important question, which I think the post answered really well, because by showing all those cool demos, people are like, yeah, this is stuff we want to do. It's not just the Pinterest layout. We want to do other things as well with it. The problem was it mixed that up with the, should this be part of grid? And by doing that, ended up with very unclear signals coming back because when people were saying yes to that post, I think most of them were probably saying yes to fancy columns. They were saying yes to all of this extra functionality. They weren't saying ergonomically, this would work best for me as part of grid, you know, in the main. I think people were reacting to the demos and stuff. And I think with my sort of writer head on, if that post had been shown to me, I'd have said split that in two. Let's ask the two questions separately. Let's show them the cool demos. And then if we want to get a feel for how people would like to use it, let's put that separately and talk about the two halves of the, of the you know, of the argument. Because um, it was already the alternate pro proposal was already there. Um, and so I guess that was really what I wanted to write. And, and the team at, at Chrome wanted was just a more balanced sort of explanation of what the alternative was, that it wasn't, oh, you can't have all of these things if we go with the alternative. It was just that we hadn't got as far as to describe how they would work, you know. Um, and that, so that was the, I think, and it goes back to what we said at the beginning, asking for feedback is really hard. And it's, I think, important to break down and be very clear about what you're asking if you want to use that as a signal. So yes, yeah, so that was really what we were doing. We were we wanted to make sure that the second part of that question, you know, was something that people could actually engage with. Yeah, you know, outside of you know, yes, we know people were really keen on those demos, and it was you know a great example of a, of a post to get people excited about the possibilities. Um, you know, but I think the, the the second part, which is, you know, how will you actually use this? Will this be confusing? Um, that then gives us some of that input, which again is a, is a much, you know, that that's something that needs to be used as one input along with, you know, the ability to to do this in the browser, whether it's going to perform well, whether it's going to cause us problems in the future, because we're going to have to worry about, you know, masonry things with every addition to the grid spec in future. Um, you know, those are the sort of things that we kind of wanted to make sure were made clear. Uh, which is, you know, why we posted um, rather than to sort of engage in some kind of internet battle. <laughs> right. That last point you made does speak to one of the concerns that, I, you know, I think people outside of the working group maybe don't realize is incredibly important to the working group, which is to look down the road and to say, mm -hmm. if we do this thing this way, is that going to close doors or is it likely to close doors? Um, or is it likely to force us in a certain direction where maybe we don't want to go? Mm -hmm. um, both of the proposals here would be evaluated on that basis, right? You know, right? As you've said, if we put this in grid, what is that likely to make possible, make very difficult, make impossible? And if we do it as its own thing, what is that likely to make possible, make difficult, make impossible? Because, you know, the working group really does care a lot about leaving as many possibilities open in the future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got that list of mistakes in CSS, the things that we're going to uh, redo once we've invented time travel. Um, and, and yeah, we, we try really hard not to add any new ones to that. And that's, yeah, incredibly difficult because we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And it's this sort of evolution of things. But but yes, I think that that to me was when I responded, I think, to the original um, sort of proposals in, in 2019, 2020, you know, that it was that that I was kind of concerned about. Yeah. You know, how are we going to deal with this going forward? Right. And that should also, you know, we should say that these two proposals are not really new. No. 
Like some of these discussions have already happened sort of within the working group, but now they're breaking wide. They're, mm. they're going public. People yeah. are starting to become aware of, oh, this could be a thing. And to most people, they seem like new proposals. Really what they are is they're new explanations and explorations of existing proposals. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's actually, I mean, you know, what this stuff shows is actually that, you know, developers are super interested in all this stuff, you know, they and, and are engaged and are wanting to contribute and, and give their opinion. And I think actually showing our workings a bit is, is, is great, you know, and actually showing that the the rigor that goes into making these decisions, I, you know, I, I really think that's a good thing for, for developers to see that they're not arbitrary decisions. Uh, and, and there's a whole load of us thinking very hard about how things should work. Um, and, and so, you know, I think actually these things are quite positive for the community to, to get involved with and, and see how it all works. I really like seeing all this happening. The one challenge with it is, yeah, I don't think we know really how to collect the greatest feedback on this because like it requires context. So like just to give some kind of idea here, um, we've been having this conversation for a long time. And uh, even as of recently, like I, I read Jen's post on webkit.org and I am like, those seem like solid reasonable points, you know, like uh, seems very lucid and it's not where I would have gone, but yeah. I mean, I, I see what you're doing there and I, it seems solid to me. Um, and then you read Rachel's and you say, oh, well, hmm. <laughs> also seems very solid. And that's that's the thing is like, you know, all of us have been thinking about it on and off uh, with some depth and like lots of information. And then we want to pull people and like get information from people and they're inevitably not like we're we're sort of measuring first reactions mm -hmm. and we're also kind of not doing it in a way that's sort of like a b or practical so like i i just sort of like i wish that we had some way to like i don't know polyfill these or something and then say okay we're making a decision our decision in the CS working group is to not decide on this for six months and in the next six months you know, everybody go try to use these as much as you can and then, you know, write about it, tweet about it, toot about it, you know, and then we'll we'll gauge the sentiment and actual experience off that or something. Because really, uh, you don't fully understand something. You don't hit up against its limits until you really try to use it in practice. So some of that is about like learning it and learning the ins and outs of it. I, I do have like a follow-up question that's like on this point though, which is won't you have to learn either way? You you know, you were saying like, well, we'll have to explain to people, individual authors will have to like understand that like this thing doesn't work with masonry, but wouldn't like they will have to even if it's its own separate thing as well, right? Hmm, yeah, I think well I'm I guess it's to me it's a bit like explaining which of the alignment properties work in Flexbox versus Grid. Because you know, obviously Grid being two two dimensional, all of the alignment properties work. Um if you're in a flex formatting context though, they don't all work because you, you it's a one dimensional layout. And this is going to be the same for masonry. Uh, you know, some of the alignment properties won't work uh, because it's essentially one dimensional. And that I think is when it's a separate formatting context, it's it's kind of cleaner to explain. It's like now you've now you've said display masonry, these ones don't work. Um, I think it just becomes less clear when you're like, well, yeah, you've said display grid, and so all of these work, but now grid template, you know, rows has a value of masonry, and so these ones don't work. And even just like documenting that on MDN seems hard. Um, so um, having done a lot of this digging around with like, you know, things that aren't implemented everywhere, I think it's one of the problems with, you know, breaking CSS down into modules and having modules that are used everywhere is explaining and documenting things that don't work everywhere in the same way. So yeah, I feel like it just adds this second level of explanation rather than saying, you know, rather than kind of repeating the story that you know, you have a different display value, 
and therefore these things behave differently we'd kind of have this two level thing where you've got a different display value so some things behave differently but also there's another property here which can change quite fundamentally which things you can use uh, there's quite a lot of i think in one of the issues is the, I, I did a, a short breakdown in 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 my post and one of the issues goes into quite a lot of details about the things that are different and i think you know something else that is also worth thinking about is just the error cases that then have to be defined you know what happens if you use something that, you know say you've been using a grid layout and think oh actually i want this to be masonry and you, you you know you find that then some of the things don't work or you've left them in what happens um what happens to your layout if you've got sort of an illegal value i, I just feel it you know to me it's cleaner from an explanation point of view yes the people will have to learn the differences just like they did between grid and flexbox yeah I mean, that's always the challenge of course of teaching something new mm. as yeah. like you say we 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 had it with grid and flexbox i mean i still see people asking what's the difference which one should i use right? yeah and yeah if you've been dealing with them for a really long time it might feel obvious to you what you should use in any given case but that is because you've worked with them long enough that you've sort of built up an intuition for, oh, in this situation, it's probably flex. And in this yeah. other situation, it's probably grid. But yeah, there, there's whatever, there will be something to learn. Every time we introduce something new into the platform, there's, there's stuff to learn. To me, it's which will be the easiest to explain and to document um, and to not be dancing around constantly and i feel that the mix of masonry and grid would lead you constantly having to like have a note every time you showed you know track sizing or whatever having a note saying ah but yes but not if you're in masonry <laughs> you know um which would be less of a problem if you had separate property names and things it would it would just be clearer as i say the mdn docs would be easier to write you know that's my day job right? you know I, I i write stuff for developers um and so I, you know that's typically with a lot of the css stuff that's how i come at it is could i write this up <laughs> you know i mean that seems like a perfectly valid and reasonable input signal. I mean, maybe I feel that way because I also do a lot of, mm -hmm. or have done a lot of documentation and explanation and presentation in the past. And yeah, I also tend to think about things in terms of how would I explain this to someone who's never heard of it before? Yeah, and I think it, it is one input. It's, and as you say, and, and how developers feel is an important input. You know, it's not something that we disregard. But I think for me, it's it's you adding these things up, and then there's this performance issue that people are going to potentially run into with with larger grids, and it just you know the, these things add up to making me feel that you know one direction is better, and uh, you know this is not unusual in working group discussions. Uh, so often, as you know, you know things start off with this very simple idea. And then people weigh in and it's like, you know, by the time it comes out the end, it looks completely different because of all the different things we take into account. Uh, so this this particular debate is not new. It's not a, a, a new thing that's happening. You know, we have these debates on a weekly basis in just sometimes, on you know, more sort of smaller things or whatever. Yeah, it's not really unusual at all. No. Maybe it's a little unusual in the way that we have these two blog posts. <laughs> Um, yeah. that are sort of introducing it to the wider world. But in a way, this is sort of giving the wider world a, a little peek into how the working group actually does deal with things. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's something to definitely get across. This isn't kind of a fight, as, as you mentioned before. It's not a fight between Chrome and Apple or, or the Safari, you know, the WebKit and, and, and Chrome. It's, it's very much just a working out of this stuff. And because now, you know, as soon as the WebKit post went out, developers were involved. And, and so, you know, we wanted to make sure that we sort of um, clearly defined the alternative point of view. Um, but as I say, this, this is the sort of thing that we do in the working group all the time is, is you know, try and figure out the important things in two or three or more sort of competing viewpoints on how something should happen and there's usually excellent stuff in all of those viewpoints and it's figuring out how that's all going to work together is is, is that's the work that's that, that's what we do yeah it's tricky from the outside things do get sort of like one dimensionalized sometimes so mm -hmm. like you'll get so we have this tweet or a position that somebody takes that gets a, a bajillion likes and boosts. And so that thing is popular in the mind of all those people. 
And then that's not the way that the CSS working group goes. And then you say, hey, you don't listen to us. Priority of constituencies. So you're supposed to listen to us. But <laughs> that, you know, it's one of a, a lot of things. And also um, a thing that, like, <laughs> it sounds bad uh, in a way, but it's also true, which is, like, sometimes developers aren't the best at that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Two that I think are good examples of this are CSS custom properties, which developers asked for, you know, basically string string replacement for <laughs> since like the late nineties, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, and we didn't get that because Tab came up with a better idea. And it's the fact that we came up with a better idea that made it plausible in the first place. Yeah. And I think it is a much better thing and is super popular now, right? Like super popular. Yeah. The other oh, yeah. one if, is if layer. Want. Yeah. The other one is layer because mm. I, I don't know if you remember, but like there are so many people who are like, Cascade is terrible, is the source of all evil. And, you know, like really there's this kind of revolution happening. And uh, Mia took a look at it and came in and said, okay, what if the solution is more of the same? <laughs> the solution to your problem is actually more layers of cascading, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, it, I think that was in the same, the same working group, uh, face to face in, uh, in Spain. Mm -hmm. And I, like, I remember saying, I, I kind of get what you're saying. And I think it's a really good idea, but I also worry about how that will be received, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it is great actually. Like it is, it really does help with those problems. And I think you know, I'm really glad we did it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, even though approximately I mean, it, no it, one was asking for it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just, that's it. And I, th I think it is, it's an amazing thing to be involved with. I mean, the, the people who are involved with CSS, I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, Miriam, um, who has done just some amazing work on you know, things like container queries and, you know, stuff that, that developers have been asking for forever. Uh, you know, and, and working with, you know, one of the great joys of being on the Chrome team is just, you know, working with these engineers and the insights they have and their ability to, you know, spend time answering questions and, and figuring out what the best way to do things is. It, you know, it really is. And, and I, so I say, I like the fact that sometimes we bring it out into public and say, you know, these are these are the discussions we're having because I, I feel that personally it's been such a gift to have been involved with this. You know, I, I don't even have a computer science degree. You know, I, I don't have the obvious background and I've learned so much from being involved and talking to these people and, and trying to understand, uh, you know. And so I'm, I'm always kind of, I just think it's cool when other people get to see a bit of that um, and then kind of understand the complexities that go into it. Yeah, and how just almost intimidatingly smart the people who are working on it. Right. Thinking about it are. Like you say, it's been a gift for me as well, and a real joy to be nowhere close to the smartest person in the room, <laughs> but be there when the really smart people in the room have these discussions to, about how should we fix this problem with the that people have with the cascade, or how should mm. we fix this deficiency in CSS layout, or how should we you know fix that people want variables and we don't have it, whatever it is, right? Sometimes, mm -hmm. and sometimes it can be a few years because, you know, we're not all sitting in a room 24 seven or even, you know, 45, <laughs> you know, it's not a full-time yeah. job for anybody to no. work out this stuff. It's, you know, a few hours a week. And, but that gives some of these things time to simmer sometimes on the back burner, sometimes on the front burner, and maybe come to a realization of, oh, people have this problem. Like people don't like the cascade. So what if we came to them and said, hey, dog, we heard you hate the cascade. So what if we put more cascade in the cascade? And that turns <laughs> out to actually solve their problem. Like the thing yeah. they actually like. Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it comes back to this thing of just, you know, the fact that we are building on top of, of things all the time. And, and sometimes, you know, well, I mean, container queries is a great example. You know, for a long time, we're like, we can't do this. 
there's no way this can happen. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, there was containment and that just gave that that step that moved it along. And, I, you know, this happens all the time. You know, the, the one thing builds on another and, the, and then and then it looks like this thing just pops up and suddenly becomes interoperable. And, at, and, and everyone's like, hang on, you said this couldn't be done. And now suddenly here it is. Um, and actually, there's years and years and years of work and discussion and 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 little steps being made that 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 made that possible. Yeah, it, when when you asked, it wasn't possible. But then we spent seven <laughs> years laying the groundwork yeah. to make it possible. You're welcome. Yeah, so it is it is fascinating, and it, it is as I say a gift to be part of and to actually see this happening. Um, you know, it really is wonderful. Yeah. So you said this is no one's full time job. Um, it's like sometimes it can be, you know, full time job for a limited period of time, you know, like we mm -hmm. focus on this. And one of the times that that happens is, you know, like CSS working group. Sometimes we have like a face to face or a breakout session. There's like a whole day on this one topic or mm -hmm. that doesn't sound like much, but so much happens when we get together and focus. And then uh, yeah. during implementation, of course, you know there's always refinement. We've talked about that a lot of times, like, you know, write a spec, the whole work group agrees, like, okay, we even have an implementation and it's like, we think it's done. And no, this is like very much kind of like almost 80, 20 rule where, you know, we think we're really complete. And then the second implementation comes along and says, Oh wait, I have a million questions. Yeah. 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 And then, <laughs> yeah exactly. And you think, Oh, thank God. Now they're all worked out. And then the third implementation comes along and says, well, what about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian, did you have any other questions you wanted to. I don't, I just wanted to say thanks so much for coming on. I like when, you know, we, we get to ask, um, questions of developers and then try to explain the sort of nuance and the background and the history. And it's always, it's fun. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. It's been a really fun chat. I mean, I do like to nerd out about these things as you know, so it's been a nice way to spend my Friday afternoon. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rachel.